Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. I'm a soldier for Christ. I'm a soldier for Christ. I'm a soldier. No, they'll never take us under, because we're bringing truth like thunder. Raining on your speakers like a ton of bricks. Hold the cross high, cause we're kept of licks. Fight the good fight with the truth, stand tall with the truth. I'm a warrior for Christ, I'm in love with the truth. Love God, save souls, slay error. Go stronger, go stronger, go stronger, go stronger. Holy Hour of Power, High Energy Catholic Radio. I propose something like this to you. If the donkey has let you down, if the elephant has <laughs> let you down, I propose that you follow the lamb. Amen. 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 And guess Brother. what the lamb of God says? He says, pray America great again. Terry, are you I love duty? it. Jess, I'm doing ready, ready and reporting for duty. But Jesse, you've been gone two days. You're out power preaching in Florida. And I'm sure we've got some new listeners. So I want to welcome all the folks down in Florida that heard you speak about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Yep. Welcome, Floridians. I know there's hundreds of you that have uh, joined the network as a result of this weekend's yep. uh, conference. Praise the Lord. And uh, we'd love to. We, uh, and uh, there was already a, 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 quite a few people that knew about us, Terry, so <laughs> that, that was right? good to know. Well, that's great. Well, Jess, for those who just are brand new, we always start our show with soul food. Yeah, reading for the Word of God, because the church teaches that Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. So let's take our readings today from Luke chapter 8, verse 16 to 18. It's short, but it says a mouthful. So Jess, could you read the Gospel short, of Luke? to the point. Yep. Yep. Here it is. Gospel means good news, by the way. St. Luke, a Greek physician, and he says this, okay? It says, a lamp is not hidden. That's the, that's the beginning of the chapter. Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ says, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that shall not be made manifest. By the way, that, that's at your particular judgment and at the general judgment. You got it. Everything will be, everything will be seen by everybody. That's the context there. For nothing is hidden that shall not be made manifest nor anything secret that shall not be that not, shall not be known and come to light. In other words, that talks about the the um, omniscience of God, or the yeah the omniscience of God that God knows everything. everything. Yep. Take heed then how you hear, for to him who has, for for to him who has will more be given, and from him who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord, the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Okay, this Jesus spoke in parables. Why did he do that? When the establishment goes corrupt, the Jewish prophets start speaking in parables. That's so that's works. the context. The establishment at the time of Jesus had gone corrupt. So now Jesus is using a Hebrew form of speaking, which is speaking in parables to the corrupt establishment. Now he's talking about this parable of the lamp. And uh, Jesus is explaining this. It's a teaching strategy here. He's saying that where the mysteries of the kingdom will be hidden from the multitudes only temporarily. But with the birth of the new covenant church, they're going to come to light. In other words, in the Old Testament, even the good Jews that were believing in Christ and believed in God and were practicing their faith, they still didn't understand God's final plan of salvation, which was the new covenant. So they were still being concealed until time came, until Christ came. Here's the way St. Augustine would, would exegete this. He says, Jesus encourages boldness in evangelical preaching. No minister of the gospel should conceal the light of truth beneath earthly fears of persecution. St. Augustine says, the faithful servant, servant puts Christ's lamp in full view displaying his truth for the benefit of all. That's St. Augustine. So what Jesus is saying in this message from 16 to 18 today, he's attaching great responsibility to his message, okay? And he's saying that the blessings of God's truth must be treasured and shared. And whoever neglects or ignores them 
will lose them. It's like they say in the gym, you don't lose, you don't use it, you will lose it. Amen. And Jesus is asking us to put the, the, the spotlight of truth upon this culture of death. Jesus is asking us as Catholics, we're like a lighthouse amidst the gathering storm, and we're called to be a light there to the ships. Well, well said, Jesse. And 14 years ago, Lighthouse Catholic Media started in 2005, and this was the reading where we got the name Lighthouse Catholic Media, and we're in 8,500 parishes being that lighthouse with CDs and booklets being passed out in the back of churches. So this is a, really a touching gospel for me, at least. Hey, uh, Jess. Terry, and a lot of clergy yeah, yeah. are hiding their light. Yeah, they are, and, and you lose it. See, here's the thing, yeah. Jess. It's like anything. If you're an, I relate it to exercise, okay? If you don't exercise, you lose the ability to walk eventually. You can't even get out of the chair because you didn't exercise. So, what happens to your faith when you don't exercise it? You lose it. So, that's why we call this the spiritual fitness trainers. Hey, we're, we use it as a, an analogy. What we're talking about is we're trying to build you up into the kingdom of God so that when you die and have your exit interview, you're prepared. That's why I hope you're listening to this show. So if you're brand new and you say, wait, hey, time out. I, I want to live a comfortable life. I don't want to oh, no. get too serious. Then you know what, dude? Turn the dial. If you are serious about going to heaven and serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, stay tuned because that's what we're going to give you. Now, Terry, well, that, that's exactly ahead. why we call it the Lord's Gym. Think exactly. about this. When you work out, you sweat. Yep. It hurts. I just There's did push pain. Sure. You get tired. Of course. This is the way the interior life is supposed to be. To follow Jesus is not a walk in the park. You got it. It's you're going to suffer. You're going to carry your cross. You're going to do penance. Yep. You're going to do reparation. You may be a victim soul. That's why we call this the Lord's gym. Because every action is like a blank check. If Christ's name is on it, it has infinite value. And Jesse, just biblically showing so your what sufferings you, have infinite value. What you just said, United I'll back that, I'll yeah. back that up in, in first cha in Colossians chapter one when he says. In the Bible, I fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the good of the church. So when people say, oh, I'm suffering, I don't know what to do with it. What? No one's taught you to unite that with the sufferings of Jesus. Can you imagine, Jesse, how much wasted pain there is in hospitals all over the world right now, bro? Yeah, every day just do an act, of, just do your daily prayers to the, uh, you know, act, the daily act of consecration. Yep. And in that prayer, you're offering up your sufferings to Jesus every day. Well said. Hey, I want to bring Bishop. In your morning offering. Exactly. Morning yeah. offering is essential. Remember, we talked about that Friday on our spiritual game plan. If you listen, you can always listen to our podcast, too, by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. I want to bring Bishop Sheen in because he's, hey, there he is on that choo-choo, full Sheen ahead here. Bishop Sheen talks about eternity, kind of like just what we were just talking about, heaven. He says, God says to us, if you give me your time, I will give you my eternity. You know what, Jess? When I read that years ago, it made me realize that, you know what? People say, I don't have time for God. You know, I'm just too busy. I work. I do this. I do that. I got to watch my TV shows. Time out. Ask yourself in this examination, what's my priority in life? What's the end game? What's my goal in life? And if you don't have the goal, ultimate goal to get to heaven, then I'm going to tell you right now, uh, you're wrong, and I'm here to tell you to get your focus back on Jesus Christ. That's all. Yep. Uh, keep your hands on the wheel. Yeah. And uh, if you take your hands off the wheel and, keep your, and take your eyes off the road, and, and what I mean, keep your eyes on the road, keep your eyes on Jesus, Amen. the author and the finisher of our faith, period, end of discussion. As Catholics, there's no other way to, the, to heaven. And by the way, Jesus is not the preferred way to heaven. Get out of here. He's the only, only way. way to heaven. Just, just, so you, got, just so we're clear about wait, that. You know what? Clarity with charity. I'll just make one more comment. Pope Francis, if you remember, we talked about him saying on the plane uh, he uh, doesn't isn't scared of a schism. Well, he also said this, and I didn't realize it until I went deeper. He said to the on the plane that if anyone has advice how to avoid a schism, come and talk to me. Well, I'm not on the plane, but I figured that's an invitation. I, Holy Father, what I think can avoid a schism is teaching the Catholic faith, the perennial teachings of the church with charity and clarity. That's going to avoid a schism, and I'll tell you why. Because when you 
preach cl- with clarity and charity, people know exactly what to expect, and they don't try to get away from it. If they do, you know, I understand there's certain ones that are going to do that, but generally, people want clarity on their faith. They want to know where the boundaries are because you can't do it without it. Now, yeah, I, Terry, yeah, here, another way to voice schism is just simple. Would you, would you, I'll rephrase what you said. Yeah, say it. We would ask Pope Francis as he's he's asking people yeah, to tell him how do we avoid it. Advice? We would ask the Holy Father to teach exactly what the former 265 Simple popes in an unbroken line of succession from Peter have taught wow. on everything. Death penalty, Amoris Laetitia, Amazon, everything. Go back and teach what every pope has taught for 265 years of the papacy. That's how we avoid a schism. Hey, I got some good news before we break, Jesse. Uh, here in the Middle East, Jesus is appearing to Middle Eastern Muslim man every night reciting the entire Gospel of John. Uh, man, are you kidding me? Yeah, he was, a, he was a gardener. He planted in there, and he just said that for weeks Jesus was appearing to him. So what do you think the man did? He became a Christian. You know, this has been happening, Jesse, for decades we've had father zechariah boutros tell us about stories like this and i keep reading over and over again you know what that tells me though jess jesus is evangelizing himself and we're not and because we're not you got it bro but here at virgin most powerful are you kidding me if you're a muslim hey you know what we love you enough to tell you about the fullness of the truth in jesus christ and we want you to know him and love him because god is love and hey, when we come back, Jesse, we got lots of good things to talk about. One's a, a crazy thing, but I want to also encourage you that we've got something on the Eucharist that's going to build people up in the Eucharist in today's show. Every day I want to try and do that because of the lack of, of lack of faith in the real presence of Christ. We'll be back with much more on Terry and Jesse on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And as I say in my shirt, we're too blessed to be stressed. We'll be right back. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well-attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist, and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. Jesus said to the apostles in Luke chapter 10, Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. According to St. Boniface, in her voyage across the ocean of this world, The church is like a great ship being pounded by the waves of life's different stresses. Our duty is not to abandon ship, but to keep her on course. May our Lord help us remain ever faithful to his church to aid and defend her. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888 526 2151. Now, 
Here's Terry and Jesse. St. Padre Pio, pray for us. You know what St. Padre Pio would have said to us? Oh my gosh. He would have, he would have quoted Galatians 2.20. He yeah. would have said, I have been crucified with Christ, Amen. yet I live, no longer I, but Christ lives in me. In so far as I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who has loved me and given, given himself up for me. Well, That's what St. Padre de Pio would have told us if he were here. He would have quoted St. Paul in Galatians 2.20. Terry, culture of death alert. Hey, before, before we go to there, Jeff, I have to give something about Padre Pio. I was at his, his canonization in June of 2002. Jesse, are you aware that his canonization was delayed because of scandal, supposedly? Yes. Are you ready? They had said this back in the 60s when John the 23rd was the Pope. He was told that that uh, people were saying that Pope, uh, that um, that Padre Pio had a woman on the side, that he had a, a relationship with a woman. It was totally false, but it was because people didn't like him, so they made scandal about him. And so that had to take decades to get cleared before he was uh, canonized. I just thought you'd know that. But here's my fun story about Padre Pio. I was at the canonization and with my four kids, and it was June, and we went to San Giovanni Rotondo to visit his grave, and everybody was there. You know, you get lots of people from the canonization where he spent 50 years. And my wife was over at the bank getting money. Uh, they call it Lira back then. And uh, I was in the park with the kids waiting for her. It took about an hour to get, you know, a long line of people getting their money. And I was listening, but everybody was speaking Italian. But there was one man who was speaking English. He sounded like he was from England. So I brought up a conversation with him. I said, what brought you to San Giovanni Rotondo? He says, you really want to know? And I said, yeah, dude, what, what's going on? He says, well, I'm from England. And back in 1983, now this Padre Pio died in 1968. But in 1983, he was on a train going back and forth to work for the last 20 years. And this particular day in, in 1983, a Franciscan monk was sitting on the train trying to convince him as he said, to go to confession. He goes, man, I haven't been in church in 20 years. I told the, the padre, I said, go pound sand. I'm not interested in going to confession. So the padre said, well, you have the freedom to say no or to say yes. So he says, okay, have a great day. He gets home, puts his feet up, turns on the TV, puts a can of beer in his hand, starts flipping through the stations. And on public television, there's the, the last mass of Padre Pio called 50 Years of Thorns. And he sees this monk ha saying mass. And he goes, that's the guy that was on the train. Wait a minute. So he keeps listening. Finds out he had the stigmata, the wounds of Christ, that he would come from the dead to visit people to try and get them to go to confession like him. And so he's getting blown away. He watches the whole show and he realizes that must have been Padre Peel coming back from the dead to try and get me to go to confession. So he doesn't go to work the next morning and the wife says, hey, honey, what's wrong? Oh, nothing. Yes, there is. What's going on? So she, he tells his wife, this is what happened to me. The guy's trying to get me to go to confession. So the wife says, well, go to confession. So they went to, he, she brought him to the church. He took an hour and a half confession, and he decided that, wow, Padre Pio brought me back. I'm going to make a commitment for life to start Padre Pio prayer group meetings up and down England. And he said, that's why I'm here. Well, Jess, when I, when I said, and I heard that, I, my mouth dropped, and I said, what? And so when I tell the story, this isn't someone like Jesse Romero just hearing me tell the story. I heard it from the horse's mouth. The guy that met Padre Peel 20 years after Padre Peel died, he came back to evangelize him. Talk about zeal for souls, Jesse. Wow. Praise God. Padre Peel, please pray for us. Yeah, there's a lot of stories like that. Well, there's sure. another there's another story yeah. of a priest you recorded years ago in Florida. Yeah. I remember some of it. What he is, was the very, he looked like Hulk Hogan when he was young. He was a bodybuilder. Oh, I know. I know who you're talking big, about. Big blonde guy. Yeah. Very secular, born and raised Catholic. That's right. And his mom was a praying mom. Just His mom was another St. Monica. Mm -hmm. And this guy was, uh, you know, into women, beach bum. Weightlifter. Big, big, big weightlifter. Yeah. Big, pol I mean, this guy looked <laughs> like a Hulk Hogan. Yeah. That's the best way I could describe yeah. it. Big, thick mustache, big yeah. blonde hair. That's right. And uh, and he, he knew all the lifeguards, all the coast guards. And what he did, he said, since everybody respected him, and he's the biggest guy in the beach, he started running drugs from Florida yep. across to across the Caribbean islands for the cartels, for the Medellin cartel and other cartels. He's bringing in a bunch of cocaine from the Caribbean islands 
into Florida. This is a great story. Now, again, Woo-hoo! he's a falling away Catholic. He's got a praying mom. The guy's just a womanizer, and the guy's just into his body. You know, yeah. he's just one of those guys that looks at, at, at the mirror and kisses his biceps all the, every time he passes the mirror. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he, sa- he said that there was a picture, as I recall the story of St. Yep. Padre Pio, that That's his right. mom had or like that in the house. Yep. So he's in the in the speedboat, and and all the Coast Guards and they all knew him. You know, hey, how are you? You know, they they'd waved him and stuff. And he goes, I'd, I'd be the last guy they'd pull over because I was I was the 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 beach, uh, you know, the beach bodybuilder. So everybody wanted to be my friend. All the police wanted to be my friend. Fire department, paramedics. So as I'm running drugs back into Florida, going past all the police, Coast Guard, nobody's stopping me. They're all waving hi at me. He says, all of a sudden, he said, this monk appeared in my boat. I'm in my boat by myself, and a monk's there. And he, and he, and he starts talking to me. He goes, this guy looked like a medieval monk or something. Yeah. He's got a tunic. He's, he's got a beard, a mustache. He goes, you could tell he's a holy man. And, and he basically rebukes me. And he, and he starts sharing the faith with me, starts sharing the gospel with me. Mm-hmm. And, and uh I guess he gets back to the beach and and he goes home and, or he goes to his mom's house and they turn on the television and he's like all discombobulated about this vision in in the, in the speedboat. Yep. And he turns on television and may have been able to WTN the running the program on father, St. Father de Pio. And he goes, mom, that's the guy. That guy appeared to me in my speedboat. And she says, that's St. Father de Pio. I've been praying to him for years for your conversion. He appeared to me in my speedboat. And he called me back to the church. Well, this big, handsome, blonde guy that looked like Hulk Hogan that had been running drugs from the Caribbean islands to Florida became so convicted and and so impacted based on that vision of St. Padre Pio appearing to him in his boat, he became a Catholic priest. I love it. And Terry recorded the testimony. I I don't know if he had his his archive somewhere. Yeah, I do. And you know what? He's a pastor in New Mexico today. I speak to him. Father Dave, I can't, the last name's not ringing to my bell, but if someone really wants that whole story, they're welcome to call the 877-526-2151 number. It's a phenomenal story, Jesse. Terry, but there's a lot of stories like that I've heard around the country of St. Padre Pio continues to appear to people, right. evangelize people, and bring people back into the church. Oh, by here's also something else Tell us. that I have knowledge of. I've talked to at least a half dozen exorcists yeah. about this, yeah. and I, I asked them, yeah. when you're doing an exorcism, I said, who's God's SWAT team? You know, because yeah, who are the we've good got a thing called the communion of saints. Right. So I, I asked exorcists, who are the saints that God really uses yeah. to drive out demons? Terry, Padre every Pils. single yep. exorcist <laughs> has told me that of there's like about six saints yeah. constantly that appear in exorcisms. Sure. They come in like a cloud sure. to help the priest drive out the demon. Yeah. It's every exorcist always says Padre Pio. Yeah. Everyone. He's one of like the six SWAT team exorcist saints that comes in to drive out demons. Well, that tells you something, doesn't it, Jess? Padre Pio, please pray for us here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Yeah, and let me just mention, just for those that don't know about him, I'll just give you just a brief synopsis from the from the uh, my Magnificat. It says, Pius or Pio was born Francesco of poor farm workers in Petrolcini, Italy. From a young age, he longed to become a Capuchin friar. Mm-hmm. His father traveled to America to earn the money to support his son's vocation. In 1903, he took the Capuchin habit, and he was ordained seven years later. From 1918 to his death, Padre Pio bore the visible stigmata, mm. the wounds of Christ, a gift he prayed to have removed, but finally accepted. His fame spread widely, and may I add, and his enemies grew, by the way. And with this came suspicion, false accusations, and repeated investigations by the Holy Office. And uh, it's under the cross. St. Padre Pio died in 1968, and here's what he was heard to say. He goes, it is under the cross that one learns to love. Wow. Uh, St. Padre Pio, pray for us. Also, Terry, one thing I read from Taylor Marshall's book. Yeah. He quotes St. Padre Pio. Yes. Right before he died, yes. 
he he had he was already saying, and he got his direct quotes. Yeah, that the Masons are already fully in the church. This wow. was in the early six sixty eight. Hey Jesse, one more story about Padre Pio to make you laugh. Mom, my senior told it this morning at mass. It made me laugh. I forgot the story, but you know when Padre Pio had the stigmata, they took him to the doctors, and the doctors came out and said, "Well, psychologically, it's happening because he he meditates on the passion, and so this is what's happened." His He's having actual wounds because it's it's mental. So Padre Pio looks up at the doctor and says, Hey, Doc, go out in the field, look at a cow. Think about being a cow and see if you got horns growing. <laughs> he said, No, this is not because I'm meditating on it. This is a gift from God. That he's asked me to suffer. So the point I'm making is the guy had a sense of humor also, even though he was very strict. Jesse, many times in the confessionals, people would say that, that he would read their souls when someone would come in to do a, a confession. With a bad confession. Yeah, the bad confession. Man, he was hard on those people. You heard those stories, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Woo! Yeah, I, he wasn't, uh, yeah, yeah. He, I, he, I, I, I don't think he'd be too friendly right now uh, with the, um, you know, what, what's that accompaniment? I think Padre Pio would say, uh, get your, you know what, into the confessional and, and repent and, and believe repent in the gospel. And repent contrition, yeah. Exactly. Harry, you know what? When St. Paul wrote Galatians 6.17, I think he has St. Father to be in mind in the future. Oh, yeah, yeah. St. Paul writes this. <laughs> yes. From now on, let no one make troubles for me, for I bear the marks of Jesus wow. on my body, wow. Galatians 6.17. If that doesn't apply to Father to St. Father to be, I don't know who else it applies to. And I think another one, Terry's always quoting this one. <laughs> this applies to Saint Padre Pio right here, Colossians one twenty four. Yeah. This is this is Saint Padre Pio exactly. He would say this. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of His body, which is the Church. Saint Padre Pio, pray for us. Jesse, one last thing. Pope Pius the tenth was the Pope when he was a younger man. And Pope Pius X said, while Jesus was kind to sinners, he did not respect their false ideas. He loved them all, but also instructed them in order to convert them and to save them. I think Padre Peel implemented that one big time. Terry, I think uh, uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe no. yourself, Terry. No. I think the first person documented that had the stigmatas, I think, was St. Francis of Assisi. If I recall, I think you're right. That's my understanding, Jess. Correct. Yeah. Someone else can correct us, but that's my understanding. Yeah. And also, uh, here's something also very interesting. Yeah. There's also been in the history of the Catholic Church where certain holy lay people. That's right. Have had this. Not only clergy. Yep. Look and, it and up. Religious. It's on the Internet. Yeah. There's there's a few lay people, Terry, that have had the stigmatas as oh, well. God. So, uh, again, uh, St. Padre de Pio, St. Francis of Assisi, all you stigmatists, pray for us. Boy, St. Padre Pio, we sure need you today in the church. <laughs> right, what's the next topic? Well, the next topic is going to be a sad one, but when we come back, Gotta you'll hear it. it. Scientists propose eating people. What? No, that, we'll, we'll, we'll be we'll right do that back. tomorrow. Father James Martin and Archbishop oh, Papu. Fine, we'll do that. Yeah. Hands on apologetics, you have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, where we go wall to wall with defending, explaining, sharing the faith. Master apologist Carlo Broussard. Carlo, welcome to Hands on Apologetics. Hey, Gary, it's great to be back in the dojo, my friend. Master apologist Ken Hensley, welcome to Hands on Apologetics. Good to see you again, Gary. Good to be with you. Michael Barber, welcome. You have entered into the Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. Gary, thanks for having me on. We are chatting with Master Apologist Carl Keating. Gary, it's great to be back with you. Coming into the dojo is our good friend Steve Ray. Thank you, Gary. Good to be here. Tim Staples, welcome to Hands On Apologetics. Hey, it's great to be with you, Gary. Thanks for having me on. Join many others in Gary Machuda's Apologetics Dojo. We have some of the best Catholic apologists in the nation. Streaming live weekdays from 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific. Hands-on apologetics on Virgin Most Powerful Radio.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. Did you hear about Archbishop Chapu? Praise God. He finally gives, was as they say in wrestling, he gave the smack down to <laughs> Father James Martin. And he needed it. Yeah, and it's about time, and I'm, I'm glad more bishops are jumping in. Not enough, but at least some of them are speaking Archbishop Chaput said about Father James Martin that he does not speak with the authority uh, uh, or on behalf of the Catholic Church. I hope not. And, of course, Father James Martin, he's going to push back, and oh, he is yeah. pushing back because he's saying, you know what, I speak with the authority of the Vatican. So uh, I- I'm glad that we're having this debate, Terry. This is a good, good thing. So the statement, the, the statement by Chaput is challenging pro-LGBT Jesuit Father James Martin yep. and bishops who support him. Yep. And Archbishop Chapu, I think he's got nothing to lose. He's 75 years old. Exactly. He's, ready, he's ready to go out. Just, yep. well, he one, should just go for broke at but, this point. But Bishop Thomas Pekraki of Diocese of Springfield, Illinois, quickly issued a statement supporting Chapu, saying that aspects of Martin's teachings are deeply wrong. No, they're scandalous, he said. And his message creates confusion among the faithful and disrupt the unity of the church. See, Jesse, those are the kind of bishops I'm looking for. Pekraki was stronger than Chapu. He was. His were stronger. He I, was. I mean, Shapu was good, but Paprocki was more direct, and I'm glad. And there's also another bishop that tweeted something as well. Uh, I'll find the other bishop right here. Probably he Strickland. Also, <laughs> uh, he also tweeted that he was in support of, of both the both their, yeah. his brother bishops. But here's uh, what essentially what Archbishop Shapu said to Father Martin. Yeah, it's a it's a five point response five points, yep. or a five point systematic condemnation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The first thing that he said to the most egregious yeah. p- components of Father Martin's pro-LGBT message, he said this, number one, Father Martin suggests that same-sex attracted people and those with gender dysphoria should be labeled according to their attraction and dysphoria, calling for the use of the phrase LGBT Catholic in church documents and language. But while the church does teach that the body is integral to human identity, our sexual appetites do not define who we are. Amen. Fa- Amen to that. Number two, Jesse, he says, Father Martin has in the past suggested that people are born gay. In his own words, it's a fact that people are born this way. Psychological, psychiatric, and biological truth. Wrong. That's just, that's just wrong, 100% Jesse. 100% wrong. Yeah. The medical, the medical doctors, the, the evidence is over. the opposite, the Jesse. Yeah. yeah. The number sign- three. Number Wait. three. Father Martin suggests that Catholic teaching on same sex sex attraction as objectively disordered, as it says in the Catechism, paragraph twenty three fifty eight. He says is cruel. What? And should be modified. In his words, Father Martin says, saying that one of the deepest parts of a person, the part that gives and receives love, is disordered is needlessly hurtful, close quote. <laughs> but here, Father Martin misrepresents Catholic teaching. That's right. The suggestion that the wisdom of the church, rooted in the word of God and centuries of human experience, is somehow cruel or misguided and does grave harm to her mission. Families have been destroyed because of this misperception, and Father Martin regrettably contributes ambiguity that's a sign of a modernist. Yep. To issues that demand a liberating biblical clarity. I like that, Archbishop Chapu. And that's what we try to do in this show, by the exactly. way, is biblical clarity. You got it. Number four, Father Martin partners with organizations like New Way Ministry that oppose or ignore the teachings of the church. And he endorses events such as Pride Month. That causes confusion for the faithful. Here's my story on that one. Show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Number five, Jess. Number five, uh, the fifth condemnation issued by Archbishop Shaphew to Father Martin. 
He says, Father Martin, no doubt, unintentionally inspires hope that the church's teachings on human sexuality can be changed. Now, uh, Archbishop says he does this unintentionally. That's, in my opinion, I think it's he does this intentionally. Let's just be he's, honest. Yeah, he's trying to change the teachings of the church yep. because he's a homosexual himself. And I've heard priests tell me that he'll admit it in closed sessions. He won't say it like on YouTube or on social media. He won't say it in public because he'd probably get his hand slapped by his bosses. Yeah. They've told him to keep his mouth shut without a doubt because a lot of his bosses are homosexual as well. But I know priests that have been there in private sessions. He makes sure that there's no cameras, no recordings. He says, turn your cell phones off, then he'll admit it. Yeah. Okay? So it says here, in the book that he wrote, Building a Bridge, Father Martin writes, for a teaching to be really authoritative, is it, it is expected that it will be received by the people of God. From what I can tell in the LGBT community, the teaching that LGBT people must be celibate their entire lives has not been received. One might easily and falsely infer from such language that the church's teaching on sexual intimacy lacks binding authority for same-sex attracted Catholics. And that's exactly what Father Martin is pushing. That's He's right. basically saying chastity applies for everybody else, but for us that have same-sex attraction, doesn't apply for us. Jesse, let me summarize. After watching three hours of Father Martin over the weekend, uh, you know, giving that must interviews. Have been brutal. It was, well, I offered it up, Jess. Come on. I gotta, you know, you gotta suffer a little. Um, I watched him, and here's what I got out of him. He said it in his own words. I be- just what this last one you said, we use he says. I believe in the primacy of conscience. And what does that mean? All the liberals, Jesse, for 40, 50 years have been saying that let your conscience be the judge. How many of you listeners have been in confession and you confess a sin and the priest says, oh, let your conscience be if you don't, you know, that's not a sin. And so let your conscience be the judge. For example, contraception, right? No, you don't have to listen to Humani Vitae. If your conscience tells you it's okay to use the diaphragm or use p- pills, it's okay because your conscience super overrides anything else. Supersedes anything supersedes else. Supersedes anything. And then the other one that he said after about four hours of listening to him that I caught him saying is that, yeah, primacy of conscience is king. So like he said in number five of Shapu, that people don't accept it, so therefore it's not true. What kind of, I mean, that's like saying I don't accept gravity when I jump off a 10 story building. Well, you might not accept it, brother, but when you hit the bottom floor, you'll have to have the reality of it. So just because you don't accept it means nothing. But here's the other part He said, I believe in mercy over justice. So no matter what, God's going to forgive you. So just do what you want to do. Those, that's what this man said on YouTube. You go check it out. It was painful to watch. But here's the, here's the kicker, Jesse. This man's dangerous because he's a very likable guy, Jess. And he's just spitting out error after error. This, um, the, 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 the conscience, let's just be honest, Jess. The catechism says you have to have an informed conscience. You, just because one guy informed says, I have the word of God, not yeah, politics. So you have your truth and I have my God. truth. Is that your, is that your conscience speaking? That's ridiculous. But you know what, Jess? This has been going on for so long that it's now inside the church. People like Father Martin and others, Richard McCormick, all these moral theologians say, look, I, I, I have the, my conscience says it's okay. Look, think about that one, what he just said. Fornication or adultery. Well, my conscience says it's okay for me to fornicate. Does that make for, think how, think that one through everybody. You see how ludicrous this is? And so we need to pray for Father Martin that he'll be converted to the teachings of Jesus and not his teachings or man's teachings. That's my prayer. Terry, if you, uh, if I could give one definition, a simple definition to modernism, yeah, yeah, go modernism ahead. is the primacy of conscience. You nailed it, brother. That's what's been introduced by the communists, yep. Yep. by the Masons, by the, by the socialists that have infiltrated the Catholic Church. Another way to understand the term modernism, every time Terry and myself use it, yep. when we say modernism has infiltrated the church, yeah. it means this. For what? For you know? For the entire life of the Catholic Church, up until the modernists basically came out with their birthday party after Vatican II. Yep. 
Because Vatican II was, the, was, as they say, the coming out party of the modernists. That's when they came out. Yep. Not that the documents... No, the documents are so... The, what happens yeah, is the spirit the, of Vatican what, II came yeah, out. Yeah, what they did, but what they do with a lot of documents as well, and even Skil- Ed, Father Skilabek, the, he also admits, he goes, we wrote the documents it's, ambiguous, many of them... But we could... Uh, so that we can, yeah, so we could uh, interpret it two ways. Yeah. They did that on purpose. Some of the, not all the documents, I mean, some are just cut and paste from the Council of Trent. You can't change that. Yeah. Okay. Cut, paste, cut, paste. Some of them, the, the, the kind of like religious liberty and ecumenism, those, there's no footnotes on those documents. Look at the bottom. They basically have said, uh, you know what, uh, here's what we think at Vatican II we should do. And that's, that's what's called primacy of conscience, whereas Catholics, we believe that the conscience must be formed by the Word of God. Yeah. Word of God. What is the Word of God for Catholics? Sacred Scripture, sacred tradition, and the 2,000-year-old understanding of the magisterium on all issues. That, for us, is, is forming our conscience by the Word of God. And modernism is... is, is it, so, so Catholicism, authentic Catholicism, is form your conscience by the Word of God. Right. Modernism is... Primacy of conscience trumps everything. Well said. And also, Jesse, we, he also talks about fake mercy. He doesn't call it that. He thinks that, that it's like universal salvation, that God automatically forgives you. Jess, that's not how the Bible teaches. You have to have repentance of you. You know, return to, you know, repent and believe in the gospel. It's not just you, you, you're going right state to heaven. You have to repent. There's no mercy without repentance. And I think that what Father Martin has that twofold thing is, yes, the primacy of conscience. And also he thinks that mercy is going to triumph over justice. So if somebody is sinning and they don't ask for repentance, that's OK, because God's going to forgive him. That's just false mercy, Jess. Terry, they, they, he just they have a, they have a poor understanding of what the mercy of God is. Yeah, justice mercy is of mercy God. go together. The mercy of God, as De- Dr. Scott Hahn says, yeah. is triggered, mm-hmm. triggered by repentance. Exactly. If Without there's no that- repentance, the mercy of God is not triggered. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. There has to be repentance. That means a metanoia. That means right. conversion. That means contrition. You got it. Partner. That means you're sorry for your sins. But uh, the article also says, Terry, uh, uh, Father Martin's fighting back. Oh, he is. He- it's right on it. Absolutely. You know what he's saying? He's saying, hey. <laughs> he's got a good point, He's too. saying, <laughs> he took the social media to justify his message. He goes, yeah. hey, I said this message, and this was vetted by the Vatican at uh, the World Meeting of Families in, in Dublin Ireland. last year. Yep. And it was vetted and approved beforehand by the Vatican. So what's your problem, Archbishop <laughs> Pooh? The Vatican already said this is a good lecture. Hey, when we come back, I got good news. Bishops defending Christ's real presence. This has got me excited about today's show. You won't want to miss it here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Wow. The bishops defending the real presence. What a novel idea. We'll be right back. We got Ernesto from Long Beach. You know, I just wanted to comment, you know, and I just wanted to thank you guys. And I kind of wanted to encourage people that are listening, maybe that are not donating, you know, because honestly, I got to be honest, I used to think you guys were a little too over the top, time, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, you that's know, right. If God gave us a lot, you know, and I'm, I have the blessing of listening to all this. And I just want to call all the people, you know, I've got five kids, you know, and I don't make a lot of money and I'm still donating to you guys. God bless you, brother. You're amazing. We gotta, we have to do this. We have to do the extra. And it's not even the extra. People see it like it's extra. Kneeling for communion, saying your rosary, saying the divine mercy chaplet. It is not extra. It's what the church tells us to do. Amen. You're a good man, brother. 30 years old, 29 years old, five kids, and I thank you guys for everything. Everybody else, man, get on fire. Fight for the truth, man. I know what I'm telling you guys. There's I no love it. out there. Hi, this is Eddie Chavez, host of Jesus 911. I want to take this opportunity to let you, our listeners, know about an event being held here at the Sacred Heart Chapel in Covina. We will be celebrating the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel on September 28th, 2019, beginning at 9 o'clock with Mass in the morning and the talks to follow. Ruben Nava and myself will be speaking, so come and hear us talk about St. Michael and Our Lady. Come join us, and we'll see you there.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. It's good to see when bishops, I love it, it when the, they come back swinging, Terry. <laughs> it's like uh, it's like you know a, a, a sprinter taking off the starting blocks, man. Some of these bishops are saying, you know what? They're scandalized by the Pew Research poll, That's right. which says that seven in ten Catholics don't believe in the Blessed Sacrament. I think a lot of these bishops, like Bishop Daniel Jenke, uh, he's saying, is this microphone on? I think that he's echoing our words. <laughs> and so Bishop Jenke and others, they're standing up and defending Christ's real presence. And I like this criticism that Bishop Jenke says. He yes. says, some churches seem more like hotel lobbies. Okay? Now, that's part of the problem. You we got talked it. about it before. You can preach till you're blue in the face, quote the catechism, quote the saints, doctors, church fathers, council of Trent, John Paul II. But if we're going to make our churches look like caf- cafe shops— or hotel lobbies, and put Jesus in the closet in the back somewhere, that's Terry is, 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 is not going to help bolster uh, our, our belief in the real presence of Jesus Christ. Of course, because actions speak louder than words, Jesse. Like your chapel. Everything about your chapel, you walk in, you say, uh, whoever owns this chapel <laughs> believes that Jesus Christ is a king and king, Lord of lords, yeah. and that he's really present in the Eucharist. You could tell by everything about the chapel. Well, you know, Jess, what I like about this article is that He wants to rekindle the faith by restoring practices that include, and I love this. I mean, I'm going to ask you right now, everyone listening, have you been in a Sunday Mass where at the end of Mass, everybody's talking and it's acting like they're in the church hall? Yes, they do that all the time. So what is the bishops here saying? Keep silent in church. If you want to talk to me, I get that all the time. For for some reason, people recognize this bald-hooded old man. I always say, hey, can we go outside and talk? Let's go outside and talk. So he also said genuflecting. Jesse, I'm sorry. You look at Catholic churches and watch people before the Blessed Sacrament in the tabernacle, and it's pathetic. I'm sorry to say that. Now, I'm an old guy, okay? But I still genuflect. Now, I get it. If you're really old, you can't go down. But I'm seeing young people, and they have no clue what they're doing. They're walking around like they're in a, in a hall. So genuflecting. He also said kneeling. Jesse, at our chapel, we just restored the communion rails. Why? When we receive Holy Communion, we want to be kneeling and on the tongue. What is that indicating? It's something very special that we're receiving. See, the bishops are saying it didn't work. This experiment we call the Spirit of Vatican Terry, II. Some bishops, not all the bishops. This is it. Don't give yeah. credit to all the. Yeah, some, not all bishops. Some bishops. Yeah, very some few. Some bishops. Yeah, very few bishops. Yeah. But more and more are coming around because you know what, <laughs> Jess? They're realizing yeah. that they, they've done a terrible job communicating the faith to the generations and they have to go back to the basics just Let me mention one thing about what you just said go which ahead, is brother. which is which is so biblical yeah oh, about yeah. the bible kneeling goes. right and receiving holy communion in the sure. tongue from an altar rail yeah okay so here, in case you haven't heard here's the theology of the altar rail okay the altar rail is like the extension of the altar okay the altar feeds us the bread of life and the altar rails is like an extension of the altar and and notice how we receive communion in the uh, you know before 1965, like little children. Yep. On your knees. Yep. Open your mouth so Daddy, the priest, can feed you. Open your mouth because you're a baby. You want to get to heaven? Act like a baby. Act like a child before God. And the old way of receiving communion, it gave us a sense of humility, Terry, because. You can be a billionaire Catholic, or you can be a Catholic that's homeless and on welfare. Yep. And, and as Archbishop Fulton Sheen would say, he says, the communion rail is the ultimate form of democracy. We're all equal at that moment uh, before Jesus Christ. No, you, and that's great, Jesse. That's yeah, great. you could be right next to a millionaire, the, the, right. the Kennedy Everybody's millionaire. The same. 
and you're all receiving Jesus the same. In other words, the Kennedy millionaires and the poor guy on welfare in front of Jesus, get down on your knees, open your mouth like a child, and humble yourself. It's the ultimate form of democracy, according to Archbishop Fulton Sheen. And Jesse, I don't mean to be critical, but we talk about humility, the humility of the church, and we're so much more humble. You know what? I look at it just the opposite. We're prideful. Why? Because we think we have to be standing and, you know, prouncing around in church when really humility is kneeling down and your actions of saying, this is God. This is not going to McDonald's and getting my burger this is the body blood soul and divinity of jesus christ as i say they clarity with charity when we people say jesus is in the bread wrong why do i say that because i hear the songs re singing that song that's jesus. lutheranism yes and jesus is under the appearance of bread and wine it's no longer bread and wine when it's consecrated it's the jesus christ and so why do i shout that because i feel like Nobody's listening, Jesse. I mean that. I, I go into church and I see people acting like they don't believe in the real presence. And for 40 years, I could have told you what Pew Research said. My statistic is 90%, brother. Yeah. You've been doing the Terry research for 40 I, for years. For 40 years, I asked people about their belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and the Mass. And for 40 years, it's been very consistent. People don't know their faith. That's what motivates me to get up every day, Jesse. To share the good news. Just, just on a side note. Yeah. I had a wedding at our chapel here. And these people didn't know their faith too well. So I'm educating them about the belief in the real presence. I said, you see that? They're doing the, the, uh, the rehearsal dinner. Rehearsal uh, uh, process. And I'm telling them, this is Jesus Christ. Oh. And they start, they're Mexicans. They start blessing <laughs> themselves. You know, like, you know how the Mexicans do that. And I'm just saying... You got to tell the people that. You know why? You can't assume it anymore. So I'm off on my, I'm sorry, Jesse, I got off, but the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. Yeah, well, finish those other bullets. You All right, other bullets. bullets. Use bells and multiple candles on the altar. Yeah, smells and bells, baby. That's what's going to show that it's special. That, and, that's very Old Testament. Very. Oh, it's very, all in the Old yes. Testament. You got it, Jess. And praying before and after Mass. You know what, folks? I got to say this. After Mass, like I say, it sounds like it's a, you're in a hall. What about Thanksgiving? Do you realize that Jesus Christ is present inside of you after you receive Holy Communion? Probably 10 to 12, 15 minutes. So act like it. But you know what? If I'm the one that's telling you this, and you're going, well, no one has told me that. Well, you know what? This bald-headed old man who loves Jesus is telling you, fall deeper in love with Jesus in the Eucharist in spite of a lack of reverence in our church. You be that person who has love for the Eucharist, because I know people have become Catholic because they say, wow, you actually believe. I can see that. I want what you have. And that's what we need to do to renew the church. We need to have a restoration of love through Eucharistic adoration. That's what Fulton Sheen's all about, and that's what this article is all about, the source and summit of the Christian life. How do we bring people back to the faith? Introduce them to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And also, uh, again, as, uh, e even a lot of Protestants, this is what brings them into the churches. Of course. When they, because a lot of Protestants, I'm not going to question, they love Jesus. Okay? Of course they do. They do. A lot of Protestants love Jesus Christ as intensely as Catholics That's love right. Jesus. That's right. And when a Protestant, especially a lot of them that like to search Scripture, when they see the connections between the Last Supper, Jesus' John chapter 6, a Eucharistic discourse, all the Old Testament prefigurements of the Lamb, the bread rained from heaven— when a Protestant sees all the connections and says, wow, this Jesus that I love yeah. has now made himself present in the Catholic Church every time the Catholics time pray the Mass wow. and the words of Christ are, 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 are prayed by the priest and the Holy Spirit is called upon, this Jesus that I've loved all my life as a Protestant is the Jesus that he mentions in John chapter 6 and Matthew 26, 26, and he's in the Catholic Church, and I've been getting cookies and grape juice all my life. <laughs> when a Protestant makes those connections, Terry, there's an intellectual explosion in their mind and heart, and they become Catholic. Jesse, you gave an example. James, one of our listeners who's now Catholic, years ago, he liked hearing our show when we were on another network, and he wanted to pray the rosary. So he came. He lived in Covina. We got to help him with the praying of the rosary. Well, now he's Catholic, and he came up to me at the parish about three months ago and says, Terry... I don't understand something. What? He says, people don't even act like they believe in the real presence. 
before the Blessed Sacrament. What's going on here? So I said, well, watch. So I saw these three young men in their 20s. I said, excuse me, gentlemen, can I ask you a question? And I ran them through the questions. And they didn't believe in the Mass, the real presence. And I said, that's the problem, James. We need you as a convert to fire people up about the Blessed Sacrament. So he's excited about Jesus. He just doesn't get why cradle Catholics don't get it. And so, Jess, that's why on the 27th of, of, uh, of this month, we're going to be having a nine-day novena at the chapel to pray for Holy Mother of the Church for that Senate on the Amazon and to try and help. This is what the bishops are asking us, Cardinal Burke and, Arch- and Bishop uh, Athanasius Snyder, to pray for the Church. So what we're doing is before our Eucharistic King, nine days, rosary before the Blessed Sacrament, because the Church needs our prayers. And you, our listener, can take advantage of that too, even if you can't come to a church. Pray for Holy Mother of the Church. There's a lot of confusion going on right now, Jess. That's right. Hey, I just want to invite you here for you locals in Phoenix. Good. On Wednesday, I'm going to be speaking uh, at uh, at a conservative American Latino organization. I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to be speaking on uh, Knocked Off the Donkey. Good. It's going to be at the Montessori Academy in Buckeye, Arizona. Good. From 6 to 9 p.m. So if you want more information, go to my website. I'm going to be giving a talk on how to vote uh, to Hispanics. Yeah. Uh, out here in Buckeye, Arizona, how to vote like a Catholic. And also this weekend, I'll be at uh, Fresno, California at the Marian Eucharistic Conference, trying to get some more listeners to our, our little growing network here. I'll be there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Fresno, California, it's called the Memor- Me- Veterans Memorial District. And I'm also trying to find 50 people that like to come with me for nine Poland, days baby. to Poland, yeah. May 13th to May 22nd. Uh, the the uh, flyers on my website, jesseromero.com. I'd love to hang out with you for nine days and get holier alongside with you. Let me just give some good news, Jesse. You don't even know this, brother. I'm going to knock you off your horse. Talking about knocked off the donkey. Uh, Jesse did an interview with Dr. Marshall, right, on his network, and there's 80-some thousand views. What? He normally gets about 30,000. What's happening is Jess Romero is going all over the country. You need to pray for this man because he's talking about his book, about the demonic influences that are going on in the church and outside the church. And I want to ask you, our listener, when you see a YouTube of Jesse Romero, like it, pass it on to your friends, because he's being interviewed all over the country right now. And let's face it, that's not bad for us here at Virgin Most Powerful. He's got Jesus 911. Join us. I mean, this is a one-man band right now going up and down the country. So pray for Jess. (laughs) Hey, Jess. We're, we're gonna. Uh, we've got a special guest on Wednesday to talk about the problem of marriage. A, a doctor who's written a wonderful book. But tomorrow we're gonna cover some more topics with you. But before we do that, yeah, tonight today was a, a topic that we didn't cover, but we'll do it tomorrow. It's good. It's a culture of death topic. We've yeah. got to talk about it. We got to spotlight it, Terry. We'll do it tomorrow. All right, sounds good, bro. And yep. then, well, uh, Jess, I always end it this way. So, what state should we be living in, brother? State of California. No, no way. State of Arizona. No, no. way. State of Grace. Got it. Hey, that's the only state you want to live in. Don't live in the state of mortal sin. And remember, America, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Global warming alert. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? And that is the goal of Virgin Most Powerful Radio, to help you get to heaven. That's the ultimate goal. And thank you for supporting us here at Virgin Most Powerful. You want to be a monthly donor? Call me, 661-972-7872. I give my cell number out. Yes, I get lots of calls, but I love you. Terry, here's our politics. Great America, great again. Amen. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests. O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole Church, grant it love and the light of thy Spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great High Priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.